everybody. Welcome and you back in. Zach Kyleman in here in the hosting chair this week. Hope you enjoyed your week three schedule of the USFL as week four of the USFLs here with, of course, another brand new edition of the USFL podcast. Again, I am Zach Kyleman in the host chair alongside my pal, friend, good buddy, co-host on the show, the man, the myth, the legend himself, the ref in with me on the opposite side, Stefan. Fun week again. More these games seem to keep getting better and better as the season goes on. The pressure, the intensity keep building with these. Roy, we only had one stinker on the docket of the four games over the weekend. How you feeling so far going into week four? I'm feeling good. It was a good week. It was a great week. It might be the best week ever as we get into the gameplay here. But isn't it funny how what we've been saying all along, all the way since the beginning of the year, give it three weeks. Week three. We're getting some barn burners in there. Again, there was one in there that maybe was not up to snuff, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, I mean, how can I be angry when USFL football just uh, just wrapped up and more USFL football is coming this weekend? And, boy, you know, it's a late one tonight, Friday night, 10 p.m. Eastern. But we'll get into the the ins and outs, the goods and the bads on that, because I did see an interesting take online. I don't know how much I agree with it, but it was interesting none, nonetheless. So stay tuned for that. I'm looking forward good, to it, though. Good tease. Good tease. Great podcast etiquette of you. <laughs> I, I expect nothing less from your from yourself. Uh, we got we got plenty to discuss early on, even leading into this into this week and kind of talking from this past week, but to knock out some tidbits that we always have for, for the show. If you aren't following us on social, what are you doing, man? Go on to Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, head on over, type up USFL podcast in the search tab and find us for that big blue emblem that it looks gorgeous stuff right there. (laughs) Hit that follow button, the subscribe button on there, whichever one you have on those three platforms. Again, that's at USFL podcast. Be sure to do that. Also subscribe on our YouTube channel, especially if you're tuning in for the first time on here. Here, or if you've tuned in, in the past and you're on the fence, hey, recommend you do that and then click the bell. It builds morale, as we like to say on this show. You're going to feel good after you do that. Trust me. I, I definitely have had the same feeling myself, hitting other great channels in the same light like ours. Meanwhile, for the channel, speaking of which, we're doing a 5K giveaway. Still building up that following, still climbing the ladder. But once we hit that 5,000 follower mark, We're going to give away one of those replica jerseys that the league is getting ready to ship out sooner rather than later at this point. Uh, That's coming up in just a few weeks, according to their shop website. So we'll be giving one of those away once we hit 5,000 subs. Just got to hit and click that bell if you want to have a chance at that jersey. Finally, though, we got to give you all the details as we do. We built up spring stock. We had a great job week one doing that. We're doing it again, only this time it's in July, and it's at the Hall of Fame campus itself in Canton, Ohio. Summer stock is coming your way July 2nd and July 3rd. Two days this time. Why do I say that? Tell the lovely people at home, Stefan. Well, I was about to drop my catchphrase. You know me, I'm all about the catchphrases. So nice, we're doing it twice. There you go. (laughs) Sorry, I had to slip that in there. I didn't hear your question, but I'm going to assume what 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 you what you were trying to say is what are we doing there, or is that what you were asking? Yes, t- tell the lovely people what we all have going in our two days in Canton, Ohio. Day one, day one, July second, Hall of Fame group tour, probably around two p.m. Eastern. We're all meeting up. Like I said, I haven't been to the Hall of Fame since I was a little kid, at least maybe like thirteen, possibly fourteen. So I'm excited to see it, but I'm more excited to come meet the fans and hang out with y'all live and in person and if that wasn't enough july 3rd baby one day before the the one of the greatest days ever fourth of july sign us up there celebrate Mm -hmm. america celebrate the usfl with us over at tom benson hall of fame field and we're gonna be throwing a party the party's hopefully in the parking lot weather pending free food free drinks good guests good times and giveaways Come get signed up for a live stream if you're not there or in person. Come and hang out with us at the tailgate. I'm looking forward to it. I'm thinking 12 p.m. Eastern is when it's going to start. Still getting some things in order, so we'll keep you tuned there. And Zach, I mean, it seems so far away, 
but it's really not. I, it's really not at all. <laughs> I remember this from Springstock. I said, oh, we got two months. <laughs> two months goes fast. So sign us up. If you do, if you do plan on going, head over to Facebook. We have an event page, RSVP. You don't have to, but it helps us. Like I said, mm. we're we're purchasing food, we're purchasing drinks, non alcoholic, but you can BYOB. And it's it, it helps us. Now I am gonna be out there for a full week. So if you guys are gonna be at the playoffs the week prior, come and party with me. We're not gonna be doing anything in the parking lot, at least official, but I'll be partying. Maybe we'll make do that, a live make stream. That two after. of us, because I'm definitely gonna try and come out at least for one of those games. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm gonna yeah. I am looking forward to Going to Canton, Ohio, like I said, it's been a while for me, and it was probably an overnight stop. I'm going to learn the ins and outs of that city and hopefully, hopefully make my way into some of those championship championship practices to bring Ooh, yeah. you some of the skinny. But, hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. Ooh, yeah, that's going to be a good time. I'm just happy to get the road trip there <laughs> instead of flying. I will, by the way, be doing a road trip going back to Birmingham. Uh, as I, actually funny as this show is dropping later th- later in Friday, I'll be leaving. So I'll be missing one of the games watching it, most likely because I'll be driving down there. So I might catch the tail end when we get there. I'm going with my dad. It's more of a trip this time, less of a business and game type of one like we did week one. It's more going for games, mm-hmm. doing a father-son thing. Should be a blast. He's been looking forward to this he, ever since... Uh, I've gotten into the spring game, football games. He's into it too with me. So he's been excited for this. He wants to see Birmingham and I want to see more of the city. Mm-hmm. So road trips abound. I'm I'm having a blast with these. That so should I'm be, be fun. I'm be having that. It should be a great time. Yeah. I'll be posting pictures. Uh, might might do a highlight and and uh, we, we full no curtains. We share the USFL podcast socials, but might drop a video via that <laughs> that showing you what it's like on uh, of course the Stallions game coming up this week because i mean i'm gonna be at that who are you kidding oh yeah i I ain't missing that atmosphere it's i mean (laughs) and they have been pulling in quite the atmosphere too i mean uh even uh jamar smith in an interview uh earlier this week he they asked him about the home field advantage and he says well normally i say no but you can see the crowds when we're playing as opposed to not so he's like "Eh, i think there might be so uh (laughs) and it's starting to become a trend here but again we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here Sure with, the, sure. with the recap, uh, a lot to talk about week three and week four coming up. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. Let's get into some more immediate stuff while we're at it. Cause I mean, I, I could wait on this. We could do recaps on it, but mm-hmm. let's just, let's just pull the bandaid off on here. Uh, as we were coming on to, on to record this show, um, we, we'd been wondering about the status of Brian Scott. Uh, if you had watched the final game in week during the week three slate generals at stars, uh, Brian was knocked out with an in, undisclosed injury from that contest. Uh, broadcast the broadcasting crew at the time actually announced that he would not be returning to the field. He did not. Case Cook has finished that game uh, in a loss there, twenty four to sixteen. And as we just got on recording, uh, Brian dropped on his own personal Twitter account that he indeed will have to be stepping away for an extensive period of time due to that said undisclosed injury. Um, I'll read off the message as follows based on his social, um, but we'll have that up on screen for you as well to check out. So it reads as goes, quote, extremely grateful for the opportunity this season with the USFL and the Philadelphia Stars. This has been such an unbelievable blessing and privilege to play football. Fox Sports and NBC have been incredible to the USFL players. Everything about this league has been first class and an absolute honor to be part of. I am headed home for now to address my injury. We'll do everything I can to make it back this season for my teammates and coaches. I have the utmost confidence in Coach Andrus, the entire Stars coaching staff, and all of my Stars teammates. To all of you who have reached out, I am extremely grateful. It means so much. Looking forward to watching my guys ball out this week. Go Stars, Brian Scott, number 18. So as you can see, dude, I mean, guy was devastated yeah. on broadcast. That was pointed out. Um, you know, it, it was mentioned that it looked like it was a man that had just had a good cry for what looks like obvious reasons mm-hmm. now. Um, hope is he comes back. Uh, you know, I don't know. Again, we won't see anything disclosed because the league doesn't really share anything until at least two days out or one and a half days out until the first game, it seems, late at night, funny enough. Uh, so we'll have to see what they designate as because they're going to have to do that. 
but seems like it's severe enough to where he might miss the rest of the season, mm -hmm. or at least the regular season if they can't keep the ship afloat and get themselves to that first playoff matchup in late June. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, just the way that the message is written, it seems like it's probably worse than initially thought. I mean, clearly it's, it's bad enough for him to go home uh, and not stay with the, stay with the team. So at least that tells me it's, it's not a one, two week injury, which is unfortunate. I mean, he was the third overall pick in the draft. Let's not forget that. He was up until his injury leading the league in passing yards and yep. leading, I mean, in all sorts of different categories. He was he was among the top. Uh, the record may not have indicated that, but, you know, looking even at the game that they played, they had an early lead thanks to Brian Scott and him coming out definitely took a toll on, on you know, the stars and just the play calling. I think that you had mentioned that they had kind of had planned for that day. Uh, I mean, clearly. I want to see him back on the field. When we did our rankings earlier this year, both you and I mentioned, if you don't know Brian Scott, by the end of the season, you will. Um, exactly. And I think at least the first three weeks that we saw of him did a lot to get his name into that conversation, people realizing who he is. And it's it really is a damn shame that so early in the season, he's going to have to step away. Now, like you said, my hope, your hope, and I know everybody that's a star, uh, a star, a fan of the Philadelphia Stars is hoping that we see this man come back by the end of the season. Looking at the North, I mean, if this is the South, this could be the nail in the coffin for that team. In the North, they might be able to hold on with Case Cookus, May, and I'm assuming they'll probably have to pick somebody else up uh, Most as likely, far as a backup goes, or maybe we'll see. Uh, who knows? Who knows what will happen there? I don't want to speculate. Again, we're recording this a little bit earlier than we usually do. So if there is any news that comes out about it, we'll slide it in like here. But if you still hear us talking, there wasn't more news. So there you go. Sign you up. Um, I don't know, man. It's just a bummer. It's part of the game, though. It's something that is, it, it, I mean, it's, it's expected to see um, that people are going to get hurt and have to leave these games. We even mentioned it, again, to throw back to the rankings. Not every person that you see on this list is going to be somebody that we're going to be talking about at the end of the year. And unfortunately, yep. this is one of those names. Now, again, he could be back by the end of the season and we could be talking about him again. Um, but those are just my initial thoughts on it. Now, I, me personally, like I said, I'm wishing you a quick recovery, Brian Scott. Hopefully you're watching. If not, sign you up. Somebody relay the message. Ditto over here. I, I love what he, this kid has been showing off ever ever since he made that his big splash in the TSL back in late mm -hmm. 2020 um you know he's been what re getting ready for that next opportunity and he made the most of it through two weeks honestly was on co on course for another excellent week of football i mean his end stats where he was pulled 9 to 13 84 yards of td at that point you know it was actually it's funny how that td even occurred cuz then we'll get into that with bug howard scoring that touchdown mm -hmm. but it was really, he was on, he still was on pace even that week. It's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. And I, I want to say it's not unfortunate just for the stars. It's unfortunate for the league. Um, this is the first year for, of course, the it's the inaugural season. Mm -hmm. So what, what do people look for with a new league? They want to look for who the guys are they can attach to, stars that they can, no pun intended, can, of course, keep on and you know root for or at least become fans of Brian was becoming one of those guys right out of the gate, very marketable for the league right now. Still can be, of course, obviously mm -hmm. the league retweeted him for a reason on this announcement because he's been making an impact already through the early going to show quality play. Now I think case cook we saw what he can deliver against the generals. I think he has, I think with Bart, I think they'll be good. Um, at least they'll be able to hang on. And again, you bring up a good point. The North is weak. It is a weak division, uh, at least, or it's one that just can't figure itself out. Um, we'll we'll talk about it, at least the, one of the two teams that finally got off the mat this week as we get into the recaps. But to kind of wrap this up, Cook is week four. This will be his first test to see can he main, can he have a full game where he takes command and he's able to step into that role, hopefully deliver a win, get him back to five hundred after a rough loss, one that they gave up fourteen straight on. By the way. Mm -hmm for that L we'll get into those right now as we're going to jump in, give you those scores. You'll see on the, on this board, we got that beautiful graphic here that our design team 
built up. I know I do that with the, qu- <laughs> with the quotes. But as you can see, Bandit's pulling out a nail biter against the Gamblers. And I know Stefan's already kind of <laughs> shaking his head at that one. Stallions, Breakers, that one, plenty of intensity. Had It was, even, it was just a good old-fashioned rough-up type of football that whole way through. Honestly, you know, you couldn't have put a better, I think you couldn't have really put a better game. Maybe Bandit's Gamblers could have been in prime time. But honestly, that Saturday slate was really jam-packed with some action. And then you'll see here as we switch over to the Sunday slate of games, Mauler's Panthers. Panthers delivered the shutout on this on the day. Really, they we were this was considered by some the toilet bowl of the USFL. The Panthers come out on top, showed some life, uh, although took some scratches along the way. General Stars, New Jersey comes out on top again after rallying 14 down. Coming out with the victory, twenty-four to sixteen. There with uh, D- with DeAndre Johnson, Vic- Darius Victor, and Trey Williams, enforcing their will on the ground. Stefan, out of these four contests, I mean, we've talked at length that the star, of course, about the stars' impact mm-hmm. with Scott being out. Um, anything else? That, I mean, what stands out to you immediately, um, or do you just want to talk about the gamblers? Uh, I want to talk about the gamblers half. real quick here. You know, I'll say <laughs> they really had me going. I'm sure you were in the chat. I was I was doing my best to rally them up yes. only for the last second. One of my favorite positions knocked me out of my seat. The kicker knocked it in. He had some mm-hmm. struggles early, but Tyler Rousa, I mean, I can't be super mad at him because, you know, the kicking woes and all that. I'm sure it feels good to not just get a field goal, but get a game-winning field goal. Now, I will say, Coach Haley, a little risky there. A little risky calling the timeout and not letting the clock run out because, I mean, the Roughnecks have been known to do a thing or two on those on those punt returns. Luckily yep. for the Bandits, they were able to go get another victory. Good for them. Good for the Bandit ball, mm-hmm. guys. <laughs> Leaving me with a tear in my eye. Watch my gamblers take another L. And, I mean, we're going to talk about week four coming up. Things aren't looking too hot. That's all I'm going to say. Things aren't looking too hot. Here's the things, the the goods that came out of the game. Uh, Luis Perez started out slow. Wrapped things up looking like, uh, looking a little bit better. DeAndre Johnson, on the other hand, I mean... He he showed himself. He worked his ass off to get this win for the team. And I know that the commentators, the broadcast booth, and even Coach Riley says he's sticking to a two-quarterback system. I won't believe it until I see it all the way 10 weeks. If DeAndre Johnson starts out this next game coming up this weekend and balls out, I would be surprised to see him bring him out of the game. Now, again, I'm not Coach Riley. I'm That's fine if he leaves him in, doesn't leave him in. And I do like Luis Perez. I think he, I would like to see him get playing time. But looking at kind of the shift up north, maybe we see Luis make a trip a little bit west, southwest to Philadelphia to fill the void down there. Now, that, again, that, that will... We'll have to see. We haven't seen, I don't think we've seen any trades yet. We've seen people being dropped and I believe picked up by other teams, but no trades just yet. But that would be one that I would keep an eye out for, especially so if Case Cook is maybe can't produce, right? Has a little bit of struggles and and maybe they give him two weeks. But I think at this point, it's going to be hard to hire from outside, outside the league, that is, right? We're heading into week four and if you wait to see how case cook is doing i mean you're halfway through the season right (laughs) Right. and it's going to be hard to get in a guy that i mean although it's not the same playbook if you bring in luis perez he's at least been active the last three four weeks right whereas you bring somebody from the outside who knows again speculation zone i should have speculation zone (laughs) on that one all day and night glad for the uh bandits sad for the gamblers But you alluded to it. It was a tale of two halves. I mean, in the first half, it looked like nothing could stop Houston. 
in the second half, it looked like a lot of things could have stopped Houston, and one of them being a Tampa Bay Bandits team. So I don't know. What's, what's your take? Are we? I, I won't give my opinion. Do you think we're in for a struggling Houston franchise? I mean, the city is known for it almost at this point. Well, I, I just think you have Kevin. I think you have Kevin someone here who needs to sit down with his roster and go, guys, why aren't we finishing these games? Or why why are second halves such a problem? You you score 23 going into halftime, and I'm thinking, wow, this thing's fixed. Mm-hmm. Houston's Houston's got got the offense in order. It could be just that, you know, kind of a hangover for Tampa Bay as well from the week prior. Houston just taking advantage of that. All of a sudden you have three you score three points. Set third and fourth quarter credit. Here's here's some things I'd be if I talking about if I were Kevin Summon. Mm-hmm. One, get rid of the stupid penalties. There were one too many oh, yeah. penalties in the second half where it's like these drives are going well, and then you have a random hold or something that's a killer. I know there was at least one good screen pass that was brought back for a holding call, and it wasn't even a good holding call. It was one that you. It was one where you have the tackle. I'm I'm losing. I'm spacing on the name right now, but you have the tackle trying to pull off to the left. And he basically grabs his man. You don't have to grab someone in really in a screen. You just got to put enough effort to fake it. He pulls him down mid screen. The screen goes for 40 yards, but it's called back on a holding call on a screen. You know, I'd be, if I was Kevin, if I was Kevin, someone, I'd be pulling my hair out mm-hmm. right there. that stuff like that. The block punt, you know, that, that alone. I mean, we could talk all day on that special teams lapse. That block punt alone instantly changed momentum. Oh yeah. Because sure. It was. Sure, it was a one possession game still, you know, at that one point. It was roughly a one possession game at that point. Mm-hmm. But all it took was that block punt. Bandits have an easy chance to walk one into the end zone. Get a TD out of that. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you're sitting there nice and pretty, 26 to 24. And then one good possession for defense on Tampa Bay's part, boom, game's over. Tyler Rousa drops a kick. You sit there and you ask yourself, how do we score 23? And we just blanked them. Honestly, they just got to finish games. Right. The gamblers, you know, they're one and two because they don't know how to play second half football. Someone and company have not been able to adjust, and they aren't playing discipline when it comes to ending these <laughs> these games. That's for them. I think that that's serviceable. Clayton Thorson is something you at least build on. I'll give you that. Well, that's that was the one pro that I saw in that game. You know, I jokingly re- referred it to the start of the Clayton Thorson redemption tour, and I'll say that first half. He was looking solid. I mean, his arm Mm -hmm. was there. His movement was good enough. He was connecting with his receivers. Uh, The second half, I would say the more, more of the problems were on the defensive side and kind of getting overwhelmed. But I would say that was a positive start, a positive start to where we want to be. Is it going to be enough next week? We'll hold off because I have all sorts of things going on in my head about that one. But the next matchup here, Stallions Breakers, undefeated, two undefeated teams early on deciding who is that dominant franchise in the USFL. And I mean, early game, there was a lot of people online saying, what is going on? Because there was, I think the first quarter was scoreless, right? Things started picking up in that second quarter, but even going into the half, it wasn't like, it wasn't what people were expecting out of two offense heavy teams granted defense is coming up big for both of the the teams there at the end of the day though home team may be advantage stallions three and oh can they continue they're going to keep doing it it's possible I'll, I'll tell you one thing that worried me with birmingham and i i'm more and more I, that defense i think uh shook off its week one uh kind of uh skittishness um, it has it has two guys that are really the heart of this whole thing there uh, with, of course, Gates and Scooby Wright. Um, I mean, that those two have been flying around like crazy. You got to give them a bunch of props. Uh, so they have something to rally behind. Uh, thing that worries me is I, I don't know, Jamar Smith taking a step back this week really kind of threw me off. Now, the Breakers do have a solid defense, but it wasn't it wasn't even defensive ineptitude. Um, a lot of it just came down to what seemed to be, according, according to Joel Klatt on broadcast, just mechanical issues mm-hmm. or really just getting down fundamentals of throwing and connecting with your receivers. Now, he did enough. You know, He was able to connect for two TDs, 
the second one being the utmost important going to Victor Bolden or going to Victor Bolden, of course, after a missed call, the play prior, it's kind of funny. They went to the same call opposite side mm-hmm. to take the lead on that touchdown to go up, ni- to go up 19 to 13 on the breakers. But defensively, the stallions have started to flip the script. Um, Jamar Smith just got to settle down earlier in games. Uh, Kind of reminded me of Clayton Thorson right now, mm-hmm. where it's just like, hey, dude, you got this whole thing in front of you. Just kind of settle in earlier. You know, the second half, sure, if you need to, that's great. But you just got to settle right on in. Um, otherwise, I mean, they've got plenty to lean on if they need for a rushing game. Obviously, Maribel, Brooks James, they have weapons on the outsides, you know. But it's going to come down to Smith to really guide that offense smoothly moving on. Because, you know, as the general showed, you get the right game plan you can score on these guys, but you just have to be consistent, and you can't let Smith and company, or at least Holtz's offense, catch fire at the right at the right moment for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a fun game, though. Like I said, it started out a little bit slow. Second half, now now we're talking things cooked up. I think a, I think there was a lot of people surprised. Again, looking at my poll that I put online, it was pretty much dominated by the Breakers. Then looking at the score. Interesting how these things kind of turn out. But the next game, like I said, this was one that I had my eyes on as well. Two teams, the opposite of the game we just talked about. Two teams looking for their first win. And (laughs) sign you up, Zach. Sign you up. That pick made the difference right there. I I finally get to celebrate a Panthers win. (laughs) Probably, in my opinion, not to slight at you, it's probably two. It's probably three weeks late than I should have because I really <laughs> thought I really thought we could have won week one. I'm going to be frank with you, but anyway, you know, congrats, congrats to Jeff Fisher and company uh, getting their first win. Um, it did come with some lumps though because you know Paxton Lynch came out of the gate and did make an impact on there. They they changed up their play style, were a lot more run heavy, really getting him into some quick passes into a rhythm. And then an ankle injury just knocked him out. We'll have to see for his status later in this later on, uh, or we'll give you an update here on that, you know, seeing what mm-hmm. that goes on. But right now it seems like Shea Patterson's going to be in the driver's seat again, mm-hmm. just due to that, which Patterson did fine. He did. Okay. Um, well, he's not, I mean, Paxton Lynch was playing the game of his career until that injury. I mean, he yes. he did not look like the Paxton Lynch that we saw week 1 when we were sitting in the stands watching the game saying, "Coach, put put Shea Patterson back in. What are you doing?" If that was the uh Paxton Lynch playing, I would have said, "Oh my god, coach, you're a genius for picking this guy up." I mean, he was looking like the Paxton Lynch that the Denver Broncos wanted way back when. I mean, he was passing the ball well, running the ball well, and, you know, another funny thing to come out of this game, Coach Fisher hates kickers. No kicker rule. I thought the I thought the broadcast team was joking at the beginning that he's, he said he's not using kickers at all today. And you know what? He was going for it on fourth down, like not even close fourth down, fourth down, just going for it. If they had an extra point to kick, we're running it in or we're going for a two point play. Now it is interesting going into the second half or the end of the first half. He was not a happy boy. He was wrong, nope. but he was not happy. They, they allowed the time to run out. They couldn't spike the ball in time. Why? Cause he wanted to send in his field goal team. So, I mean, let's give a little bit of love to the kicker over there. Anyway, he didn't get his shot, but you know what? Jeff Fisher, I, I like it. I think it's a funny tactic. Screw it. We're not going to make the field goals. We're not going to even try them. The punts might be a little bit wonky. We're going for it at fourth and I think it was like fourth and eight. He went on it. I wouldn't doubt if he would go on fourth and 19. He did not care. And you know what? It got him 24 nothing win. Well, and he converted on all three of his two point conversion Mm -hmm. conversions on those touchdowns. So clearly was going for that game plan. And yes, he's, He's been a little more gutsier as of late in terms of when he's given a chance to score. He just he just says, screw it, let's go for the extra points beyond you know your typical PAT. Uh, and that's what he's doing right now. Uh, a little bit of a surprise. Uh, we kind of kind of need to talk about this because it did affect some elements of the game this week. Uh, if for those of you that keep in the know and try and follow when they drop the injury reports on social, uh, Reggie Corbin wasn't listed as active. And so when I flipped on the game, 
on to USA, I'm going, uh, hang on a minute. This, why is he here? And sure enough, they clarified it later on, um, via there's one or two gambling sites that asked the question too, as well. I bring up the issue and they clarified to them saying, you know, we, it was an oversight. We have new stip, we have new safeguards in place for this type of thing. Um, we're going to be trying to mitigate if not have this happen again, but yes, that Corbin, I guess was active game time. He was listed inactive on social, but he balled. Oh yeah. Uh, like I, I was, there were two things I was excited for, but for the Panthers, when the draft happened and you'll remember this, I loved seeing Stevie Scott and Reggie Corbin being picked up that big 10 back backfield tandem. Mm -hmm. Corbin's been inactive for the first two weeks. I wasn't expecting him to play this week, so it got me a little little down because I thought he was going to be in, and then sure enough, he's in, and what does he do? Goes off for 133 on 20 carries. You know, 6.6 a clip, a touchdown, has a 64-yard rush in this whole oh, shebang yeah. as well. Guy had a day for what is, I think, the Panthers' identity. You know, for some reason, the North is becoming very much the running division in the USFL between the Generals and the Panthers. Mm -hmm. You know, between those two, even the Maulers who, Jesus Christ, I mean, talk about taking a back, a backward step for what I thought was progress last week could have just been disguised as poor defense on the stars part since they are, are, are the worst rushing defense in the USFL. But yeesh, that, that alone has its own discussion, but Corbin happy to see him out there. The Panthers have an identity. What do you, what do we do about the Maulers, Stefan? Like it, it just seems like, you know, I thought. I thought Kirby Wilson had something mm -hmm. going. You know, he picked Josh Lowe. He said, this is our guy. And they had a little bit of momentum. And then, sure enough, this one, we get, we go back to what was week one. We got the split quarterbacks. We got heavier run set, le less on, less leaning at times on the passing game in certain situations. It just felt like, again, they went back to the mess a little bit. Yeah, they definitely took a step backwards. And that's, I mean, not a good sign early in the season, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, I said I said this before, uh, with a 10-week season, every win does count, but they're not out of it just yet. They're lucky. They're lucky they're in the Northern Division where things are a little bit back and forth, but they're not doing themselves any favors. I mean, coming, I mean if they get to week five without a win... They might not be mathematically eliminated, but I mean, that, that might be enough to call it a day. Um, and I, I'm trying to think back on anything of redeeming value, like a real redeeming value that I saw out of that game that they might be able to work on. Uh, I did see them say, screw it and go for the longest field goals ever in that game. Yep. <laughs> I think we had a 59 yard attempt in there just for the heck of it. And, uh, Another over 50 yard attempt. And, uh, I yeah, mean, zero for, zero for three on the day for Ahmed. That was, that was unfortunate for, for him, not helping his tape. No. <laughs> it, although credit, you know, it is a job description, but I digress, you know, situation be damned, <laughs> you know, take it as you will. Uh, rough day. Uh, really. I'll, I'll tell you the only, the only bright spot I had one thing that sucked. Uh, I'll say the bright spot next, but one thing that did suck Bailey Gaither's not being in, um, late scratch mm -hmm. for an injury. Uh, and that might've affected Josh love a little having that connection, you know, leading passing, leading receiver right. going into week three, kind of just being instantly removed bit unfortunate, but you got to work with what you got. So that's the other argument there. Uh, the other bright spot is Madre London came and played a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. out of his 11 carries, got 68 yards, 6.2 a clip. You know, they have a tandem between him and Groshek. You know, one or the other can get hot any given week. Um, but I think, I don't know, the play calling I've noticed, it just is not, does not help the Maulers at all. There's no flow mm -hmm. to it. Right. You know, it's like, we're going to stick with run. And then like, they'll like, all of a sudden you'll see Kirby go, oh, wait, I, I got a passing game. I got to worry about. And then they'll switch to pass and it'll be inefficient because it's, there's no rhythm there. You know, mm. <laughs> or be like, uh, well, I don't know. Love didn't look good for the series. Let's throw Kyle in again. Right, right, right. And then let's throw Love back in again. Mm -hmm. Again, and it's the same deal where it's like even worst case scenario than it is with the generals. Pick a QB, guys. Come on. Well, it doesn't help the other players out there either to have to kind of bounce back and forth between the playing styles and and things of that nature. So, I get why they do it. Um, but I mean. It's not working, at least in this inst instance right here. Clearly, twenty-four nothing. I mean, the first shutout in the USFL, and not 
And it wasn't a defensive matchup on both ends by any means because, I mean, you went down three touchdowns, all with two-point conversions. You tried to get a couple field goals in there, but like I mentioned, that, I mean, that is, that's a lot to ask for out of your kicker. Now, I'll say if the dude would have made it, sign him up. And maybe he has, and that's why they throw him in there. But, boy, that's that's a tall task in the middle of a game. So, either way, they, they got the result that I think a lot of people expected. Uh, I know the Panthers fans are happy to get one, get one in the win column, even though they understand what type of win this was. And right. considering that two of the touchdowns were made by somebody that we don't know, we don't know if he's going to play next week. Doesn't seem as dire as Brian Scott. Um, but yeah, we don't I mean, know. I mean, we don't know. I mean, Shea Patterson, look, he, he started all right. He was the number one overall draft pick. So mm-hmm. people have obviously had their words on the lower level of play than he was for his draft value. Um, but he's going to have to learn to step. He's going to have to learn to step up. Like it's no more flip in between. I don't think this week you'll see it. I think Lynch looked like he was pretty banged up. Mm-hmm. I mean, when he had one play in his last series where he steps back and he just collapses because he couldn't yeah. plant the foot. I mean, that that's a sign right there. You need to sit the guy for a while. I was surprised bit. they kept him in as long as they did because he was injured after one of the touchdowns and then mm-hmm. he came in for the next drive. And like you said, that's when he was really. Right, he trotted. Yeah. He tried to back on out there himself, but I'm like, I said, I'm assuming Scott or you're going to see Shea Patterson starting for this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's fine. They just need to, I think Jeff Fisher, you see in three weeks, he's like, okay, what am I good at? I got two high quality running backs, two of the best ones, at least in terms of overall running in the league. I believe it was, I've, I've seen their second best mm-hmm. in terms of rushing behind the generals right now. So what am I good at? I can run the ball. What am I, what can I also be good at? Well, Shea Patterson is mobile. Maybe we can get some option plays in there. Um, roll him out of the pocket. Patterson's better outside the pocket. Mm-hmm. Anyway, you know, just get him in bootlegs, get him in play action passes. Don't even bother trying to set up a standard pocket unless you really feel like you have to, mm-hmm. you know, right. that's, that's all I got. Final game of the night. Speaking of that rushing attack, Jesus Christ, the generals, they went back to their week one ways of just, I'm going to run on you mm-hmm. and you got to stop us. And there's, I mean, at some point the stars defense just could not do anything and credit, you know, they had to put in case Cookus because of the set injury to Scott Cookus showed that he can hang in thing is late in that game, a few questionable play calls, mm-hmm. uh, derailed a few drives and the generals. Well, if it's a one thing with a run game, it can kill clock pretty quickly. Right on. Uh, that's mostly what they did on their final TD drive. They just killed a bunch of clock on a drive and put a nail in the coffin for the stars at the end. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say, like you you kind of alluded to, I, w- I was very surprised at how well Case Cookis did out there. I didn't know uh, much about him, but generally speaking, you know, with a backup, you assume it's going to perform maybe a, maybe a step down or a back step, uh, half step down than uh, the starting guy. But he looked pretty good. It, like you said, there was some, maybe some missteps near the end of that game, but I'd say it's a good start. Now, week four, that's going to be his big test, right? Coming in, yeah. starting the game, can he stay consistent? And, I mean, we haven't heard who who they're going to bring in, but, again, whoever they're going to bring in isn't going to have that playbook down just yet, so they're probably going to need to rely on Cookus for a majority, if not all, of that game unless we do see something like a Perez coming over or somebody within the league that has been out there staying active because I mean, bringing up a guy, Brandon Silvers would have been my guest, but I, I think he just signed with fan controlled football. If I remember correctly, that is, that is correct. He's rumored to possibly be starting this week for that. Right. So, right. Hey, so more power to him, I guess. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sign him up. This is, this is the thing that I love about spring football, more opportunities. If he didn't get in the USFL, look, he's still mm-hmm. playing somewhere. Uh, we might see him next year in the XFL, or maybe we'll see him move into the USFL. Who knows? Uh, but either way, we're seeing those opportunities out there. Stars were looking good. I mean, early in that game, Brian Scott in there, it looked like they were going to coast to a victory. With that injury, I think that's exactly what the, what gave the Generals kind of their their opening to to wedge themselves in some meaningful plays. Maybe they're allowed to make a couple couple uh, one mistakes more than they're used to without it damaging them. And like I mentioned earlier, DeAndre Johnson, I mean, he came out and did very well for his team this week uh, oh, yeah. and, and ultimately pushed him over. Now, it's interesting to think about, though, because, you know, going into week one, 
the generals almost pulled out that game. You know, I mean, we're actually really close to this being a three Oh generals team. And maybe they're that sleeper team that, you know, not a lot of people have been looking at, but maybe they will break through. I I mean, we'll have to see it is early in the season. I mean, they, they had an opportunity to capitalize on yesterday. Uh, the week prior is I think the team they were playing that kind of helped them pull that one out. But we'll have to see. I mean, this could be the sneaky sleeper team that nobody expects to really kind of drive at home. If they can tighten up a few of those wedges, if Coach Riley changes his ways and sticks to one quarterback throughout most of the games, I think they could become a force to reckon with. But, well, I mean, only time will tell. Maybe so. I, I think uh, for for the generals, I think he also is doing that – I. I guess because he has two different quarterbacks that have different play styles, if I want to put it that bluntly. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's it. That really comes down to if they gonna or if a team can stop that rushing attack the Generals have, which so far not really. I mean, the Panthers kind of did week two, mm-hmm. but even then the Generals still squeaked it out. So, you know, Johnson to me now it's funny. I started the season with Perez and for good reason. Week one, he did a really solid job. But now it seems like just Riley likes to run, is doing like a run-heavy offense now more often these last few weeks. Johnson fits that mold better, and I think he's starting to calm down a little bit when he's given his passing opportunities, given, you know, limited but still enough to where I think he's going to be settling in. So we'll. I want to see how this develops this week for their game coming up. Uh, they do have a bit easier of a matchup this week mm-hmm. to kind of – work out some kinks. So we'll get into that in just a second here. Um, And yeah, time will tell. Uh, I'll tell you for the star, the last thing for the stars, if they really did want to back up, um, you brought up, of course, a few places you can look for. Really, the Stallions might be the best option. Mm -hmm. Um, Remember, they got Magoo and Montel Cozart sitting on the sideline. Kind of weird to think that there's a team with three QBs in the USFL right now. Uh, if you really need a backup and you don't want to get Jim pop and his scouts out there signing someone, you might want to give up, skip Holtz a call and say, Hey, uh, is Montel is Cozart available? Maybe Magoo, you know, cause I don't think Magoo's coming in anytime soon mm-hmm. unless Smith loses a game badly and does another stinker like he did <laughs> this week. So we'll, right. we'll find out, uh, is all I can tell you players of the week. We are going into some of these stars. We already have kind of highlighted, over the course of this offensive player of the week. Now this was kind of brought up. <laughs> I would say some people maybe thought this was changed, but Hey, the breakers keep finding ways to get in with these votes. Johnny Dixon, former Ohio state receiver. Now new Orleans breakers receiver in a losing effort gets seven receptions, eight, six yards, two touchdowns. He's the offensive player of the week this week for him. He's getting some air force <laughs> sneakers. Those Sign custom ones. That's, that's the thing. All these players, if you're a player of the week on any of these categories, you get those air forces coming your way. That's their little prize to you. Defensive player of the week. This was tight. Yeah. It uh, came really down to the wire. Uh, the tight, it was like 0.5%. Yeah. Less than vote. a percent, a half of and, a percent. Yeah. Demarcus Gates pulled it out away from Chris Odom at the final buzzer. Odom had the lead early mm-hmm. for most of that 24 hour session. He was leading. And then Stallions fans just rallied him, rallied Gates up. But I mean, look, Gates had the game ceiling interception, of course, he also had 10 tackles. I mean, guy, guy was really all over the place for this one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what can you say? Mm-hmm. You know, the, obviously, Scooby Wright, people were like, well, wouldn't, shouldn't Scooby else get a consideration? I mean, Stallion's defense alone, there there were some people you could argue has, mm-hmm. had their moments. Right yeah, on. He also had the fumble recovery that Scooby Wright helped have some sort of bid in for that goal line stand that could have completely altered the course of this comp- this contest for them week two. Mm-hmm. So keep that all in mind. And then special teams player, I mean, Tyler Rousa, who, who else, you know, oh, yeah. with game winning field goal and all two or three on the day helps, helps with a rally for the bandits to come from behind and hopefully for them get shake off what was an ugly week two and what they might be able to use momentum here for a crucial matchup in week four. Oh yeah. Now my player of the week. So I agree with all these actually, before I go into my player of the week, It is interesting that the breakers have now made it three weeks in a row Yes, with arguably and nothing against Johnny Dixon, but I think maybe some of those other candidates were a little bit more deserving. Another interesting call out here though, too. I think the game of the week to watch last week was breaker stallion. So I think it's only natural that we see the offensive 
and defensive player of the weeks go to those. And like you said, there's nobody other than Tyler Rouse this week with a, a game winning field goal. But me, the player of my heart, the player of my week, and this happened right before the week kicked off, Reggie Northrup of, you know, my Houston Gamblers, <laughs> there was this viral video that started circulating of him, what seemed to be smoking a cigarette, not during practice, but on the field <laughs> during practice. And of course, there was, you know, this started spreading around. You had places like Barstool naturally picking it up and then nothing against them. It is their type of humor. And you know what? We got a response, not only from Northrum himself, but even the gamblers got into the fun and they retweeted the video with an addition at the end. So essentially here's the good news guys. It was a fake cigarette. So he's got a statement here. It's a fake cigarette guys. LAMO. I would never smoke cigarettes. They're bad for you. He didn't say that. I added th they're bad for you in there, <laughs> but the SIG represents the attitude that I hit the field with like the old school ballers of the sixties, seventies. They were some of the toughest, meanest SOBs on the field, making plays after dragging a whole cigarette. So that's kind of, he's putting himself in that mentality. Now I will say this. There was a lot of guys that when they initially heard this said BS. P.S. But it's it's true. I think he showed a, a picture of it or a, showed it in his video. And mm -hmm. he even says, P.S. You can buy these from your local Spencer's uh, or from Spencer's in your local mall. Now, needless to say, I loved it because now if it was him smoking a cigarette on the field, I don't know how much I'd be laughing about it because it wouldn't be a good look for the league. I'm not going to no, lie. If it was a real cigarette, that would be a problem. Right. But problem. Th the story that came out of it, I mean, sign it up. That is great. Sign up the gamblers. I want, you know what? Here's what Northrop needs to do. He needs to go be handing these out to the rest of the guys on the gamblers defense so they can get that <laughs> attitude so we can close out these games. But I don't know. So you were in the discord when it first dropped before the response. What was your, what was your initial thought of this well, whole thing? I, I was trying to read the room because like, with that, I mean, everyone already with bar stools, they're like, so I guess we're allowed to smoke on, <laughs> on the field. Dang, that's a that's unique. And of course, every you got early reactions, people going, this is ridiculous. How is the league letting that happen? And you know, in my head, I'm like, well, I don't know about that. I mean, maybe like I was like, I'm trying to read the video. Like one, it wasn't lit, mm -hmm. you know, or like you're doing like the social media thing. Like right. you're trying to like read between the lines on what it is. And it's like, well, it wasn't a lit cigarette. So I don't know. Maybe he's a smoker. And he's waiting to get on the side and do it real mm -hmm. quick um, or something like that. I was trying to mess. So maybe it was not even a cigarette um, because it, up until they said it was fake, I'm like, Oh man, they need to figure out what's going on here. Cause I, I don't want to be having to talk to people go in my DMS going, this is ridiculous. How could people yeah, right. let, let these players smoke? You know, they're supposed to be icons in here. I'm like, I'm like, Jesus. Uh, no one did that by the way. I'm just saying that if it was real, it that's probably what would happen. Ended up being that way. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, he did that. And I'll tell you what, here's how Northrop packed it up. Dude is, was the hardest hitting player this week. Oh, yeah. Um, he had, he had some flat out, he had some flat out pancakes of people in terms of just jacking them up across the field. Now credit, he got flagged for at least one of those. So I'm not, you can't be fully on it, but like guy is at least bringing the mentality, you know, XM, XMMA guy himself, right. you know, he is a bruiser out there, you know? So that, that 60s, 70s, I'm just going to go out there and beat the crap out of you and, you know, look like the tough guy with the SIG. Like we're talking that era of football. Sure. Yeah. He gave that up. Yep. I'll give you that. Uh, he plays to that standard. I'll give him that. Northrop is one of those bru is one of the bruising bruisingest defenders in the USFL. You know, what? it's just unfortunate they go to penalties in the second half of that game that don't help in the grand scheme of the game. They'll get those things solved. Like I said, hand out a few packs of these smokes to a couple of those guys. Get them in order. We got plenty of time left, but it is running out. But I, we had to talk about this. This is too oh, funny. We, well, I'm a yeah, gamblers yeah. guy. Gamblers smoking viral. Sign us up. Gotta gotta bring up bring up the story. You know, I'll tell you what is uh his team. It's funny. I thought you were gonna. Besides this, when we were coming into the video, I'm like, well, he's in, if we're talking Northrop, his team. I would say one of his teammates. Uh, I felt like he got a little at least uh, brushed on the offensive player of the week award. 
because uh, I'll tell you, Thompson and the Thompson that Gamers backfield, mm-hmm. you know, Mo- Daryl Moose Johnson has been hyping this guy up since week one. And yeah, he's come to play. I mean, leading leading rusher in the league right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in a losing effort, dude did have a day. You can't you cannot deny how well he was. I mean, we're we're talking twenty four carries, one hundred forty seven has a fifty five yard TD on his own, and really had one of his actually had a play called back later on in the game too. Again, the penalties. So, you know, some people get left out. I see the league's trying to do one per game. Mm-hmm. Because Tamu was the other option, I actually voted for Jordan Tamu in that contest. Now, if Thompson was there, I would vote for Thompson. Yeah, gonna be gonna be frank, but yeah, I digress. You can only you only do what the poll says. Mm-hmm. But maybe maybe that's my advice to the league. Like, hey, maybe you should read the room if it's multiple in a game. Maybe you throw it in there instead. You know? Yeah, it's that, tough. That, I mean, you only have four t- choices on Twitter. You stuff. know? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Can't say too much beyond that. But have to give an honorable mention because that eff- that effort was insane. He is right now. I'm going to label it. He's the best running back in the USFL right now. And which I'm glad that he's on my team now. I, and like I said, we got plenty of time left. We just got to start turning things around before we get into action coming up and what the gambler schedule looks like next week. And uh, God forbid the picks. God forbid. Let's look at at the ratings. And now again, you know what? All of a sudden, Zach, the sky isn't falling. The sky is no longer falling because we saw a slight increase for the showcase game on Fox this week. Oh, so the early game bandits gamblers on Fox, 825,000 formidable, like it, sign it up. Stallions breakers, 1.1 million, a little bit over 1.1 million up 6% week over week. Now let's see every time that we watch the spring football leagues, I don't think we've hit a baseline by the third week. I don't think so. I think it usually continues to go down. Now it slows down. Sure. But I think this is the first time in a long time, and it's not a huge increase, but an increase nonetheless. Mm -hmm. I think this is good news for the league. Now, again, people might shiver at this next one. Mahler's Panthers. Again, I don't know why they would shiver. This is the two unwinning teams on USA, which we've talked about before. Nothing against USA, not known for sports, early game on Fox on Sunday. Uh, Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. We had 292,000. But again, not too far off from where we were the weeks prior. I I think the big one, and I mean, clearly the big one that Fox is looking at are the ones on Fox, right? No numbers for Peacock. I didn't think we would. I don't want to even speculate because I don't, honestly, I don't even know how many subscribers Peacock has because that would definitely come into factor there, but probably less than the USA broadcast. If I were to throw a dart and guess, but overall I'd be pleased with these. And again, for this reason alone, let me see if I have those numbers up available to me. The numbers from the NHL playoffs, Zach, the NHL playoffs came out um, earlier uh, this week they did. And yes, they I did. would say the USFL was very competitive against the NHL playoffs, which, as we mentioned earlier, what was it? $120 million a year that they that mm-hmm. they paid for the for the NHL. That's about right. Yeah. So about 120 mil. Penguins Rangers triple overtime game. Triple overtime. That's a game that I mean, once you get into overtime, you're gonna have people tune in just because of that. Uh, a little over a million. And I mean, some of these other games, 350,000. And again, when we're trying to do apples to apples here, the NHL has been around, I don't even know, over 80 years at this point, 75 ish, something like that. It's over 75. Yeah. It's definitely established. They're on ESPN. So it's not like they're hidden. Some of the games are going to ESPN too, but again, comparable. If you look at the ESPN two, 350,000. Look at the USA broadcast, not a sports channel, Mm -hmm. 100,000 less. Again, this is playoff hockey. I get hockey's not the most popular sport in America. I was where I grew up in Detroit, hockey town, baby. One one day we'll get back to our greatness. But, I mean, the USFL is a brand new league, and they're staying competitive. All this does is show value in their product 
right? When they want to renegotiate with whoever it is, they could say, well, how much are you paying NHL? Look at our numbers. Look at their numbers. Don't you think it should be somewhere closer? And I think that's how you can kind of finagle this around. Either way, I think that's the context. That's the context that a lot of people are either leaving out or missing. A million people's good. A million people is good. Anywhere around a million people is good for broadcast television. And then anywhere over a quarter million, I'd say, is solid for cable. And maybe like the FS1s, the USAs, the ESPN2s, if you will. And they're staying where they need to. Have we hit the baseline? I don't know. We'll have to find out. Because last week, two undefeated teams could be a little smoke and mirrors. Next week, though, if it stays consistent, I mean, I think you've basically found it. And that's a good sign to find it already. Yeah. Well, they're going to be keeping testing how they're doing this throughout the year. Uh, cause I mean, we're still, we still have plenty more FS one games we got to mm-hmm. do USA still has plenty more on their docket that they got to do. Uh, and really the FS one, we really haven't even had, I think consistent, like are we at a baseline numbers right. yet? We had one game that was rain delayed and got 262 K. Uh, and then we had one that hit well over 400 K in its next week after that. So mm-hmm. we need to see if that jumps or if that declines as well. We'll find out this week, although credit it's a late game that they're doing. It's one of only two mm. that are at 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll get to those in a second. But just saying, you know, in terms of numbers, this was nice to see. And I'll tell you what was also nice. The Bandits-Gamblers game, A, it was better than the last M- last over-the-air broadcast game from NBC. Um, Fox, obviously, we've, we've touched on. They seem to be doing a much more diligent job at promoting anyway. Mm. But second, at least uh, better than their previous secondary over-the-air game. So 825 compared to NBC's 812 from the previous week. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Stallions breakers one really impressed me. Just the fact you had a hundred K jump in viewership alone. Um, They did bill it well. They advertised it well. Uh, And I think as we're seeing, and we discussed last show, the Stallions are going to be in the spotlight. There's there's three and Oh, they're the team in town. They have nice crowds. And as we're seeing with broadcasts and people giving feedback, People like to see rowdy games with the hometown crowd being able to be in the building and in prime time yeah. in a very high octane setting, which we'll get a second game like that this week. Anyway, that should be fun to watch. I'll get to watch that one in person when we highlight, when we preview it. Uh, but I'm overall, ex- the Fox numbers I'm happy with overall. Uh, actually, I, I'm actually really even, even happier with them when you consider that Gamblers Bandits was going on during the end of the third day of the draft. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know the third day of the draft isn't as popular as the first two. It's not as high profile, but people tune in for this thing. Like the draft is an event. So, you know, the fact that there were still diehard football fans that said, you know what, I'm going to tune in over here to Fox and see what they're up to. You know, that was pretty nice to see. Um, The only thing I'll say with USA and, you know, I'm, I don't know if this is just NBC or what, and they're still figuring some things out. You know, USA also, besides it being the toilet bowl, they were having like technical issues as well. Like you had Jack Collinsworth or like Jason Garrett's audio getting, they were messed speaking up. in tongues, bro. They speaking were speaking in tongues. Dude, it was like going backwards mid sentence. I don't know how they, I, 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 yeah, I don't know what was going on there. Actually. I speculation zone. Yeah. Speculation zone. So I believe I read that this is the first week that the broadcast booths were working remote. But in the NBC case, I don't think that is true because I believe maybe not. Maybe Jason Garrett wasn't on the field this week. So if that is true, speculation zone, I mean, you still got to fix it, but it explains why it, why it was so prevalent. And I was hoping, yeah, you fix this. It went on a good chunk of the game, if not the whole game where the the tongues thing, at least. Um, But yeah, I mean, you'll get there. That's live TV for you, buddy. (laughs) <laughs> you know we didn't get either there were no drones this week yeah i know that was really sad i was bummed I, by that i haven't really found a concrete reason why that didn't get implemented but no drone footage that, that was unfortunate i i you know the i think the first two weeks that highlighted that there's possibilities i don't know what the issue is behind it hopefully we'll get a better answer and maybe week four they come back with them we'll see but um if they aren't back week four we need to we're going to start digging and asking what's up because people really like those overall so we'll find out the usa game though i mean Tongues aside and all that, you know, it was the toilet bowl. I'll give it a pass on that. 
I do want to keep evaluating how those go on cable, you know, because mm-hmm. it seems like NBC so far has had the lower end of the rating stick compared to Fox. You can make arguments for that. NBC, I, I'm, you know, no, no, no sugar coating at all. They really don't promote these games much as much as Fox does. They do when it comes to game day mm-hmm. or every now and then, but they don't do it where Fox, where they send out to local affiliates and they put the fill, make the affiliates put the ads on their markets and all that. So something to keep an eye on and we'll get to see it with this next slate of games coming up overall, though, I'll give a thumbs up. I'm happy to see the increase 6% increase getting some stable base. That's nice. Um, Fox is probably hoping to keep around that same base for this next primetime game this weekend, Mm -hmm. uh, as well as to see where NBC is with their new next 3 PM. You know, you want to see if they're going to stick around at 800 K mark, or if they can maybe even jump that up a little bit. We'll find out when we get into week four, as we'll get into week four right now, as we talked about anyway, um, I hinted at this 10 PM game this week, kicks things off on Friday. Stars Panthers and uh, Panthers fans are starting to catch on and notice. Hey, wait a minute! My team's getting put on all these we- on all the weird off off night times. Hey, look! You win this week and you go two and two. They might be switching you around. Like this is a playoff implications contest once more. Mm-hmm. Early season, you know. I, I said that last week just with the Breakers and Stallions. I'll say it again. You know, the Stars slipped to one and two. Panthers got the win. Without Brian Scott, this game is a little bit more in the gray area for us right mm-hmm. now. Um, what, how do you, and we'll go through you know, contest by contest, but for this late night, 10 PM matchup Friday night lights, what are you looking at Stefan? I mean, it's going to be an interesting one. Well, I mean, we're going to learn a couple of things. One, it was it a fluke with Michigan last week, right? So is their defense going to come out? Uh, can Shea Patterson hold a full game by himself? Uh, from the stars, clearly, I mean, all eyes on case Cookus. That's I, everybody's going to be watching him. I think he had a good starting base in week three. Uh, but I mean, starting a game from from beginning to end is a completely different story. Uh, and so it might I mean, it might give the Panthers an opportunity to get another win here. Go back to back. Now, I alluded to this earlier. Interesting take that I saw online about Friday, 10 p.m. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I alluded also that I don't know how much I agree with it, but it's worth the discussion here. Somebody had mentioned that 10 p.m. Eastern is actually a great time for people that like to tune in on the West Coast. Now, I did live in Arizona and I did live in Pacific time zone for at least half of the year. And yes, sometimes if a game starts at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 5 p.m. Pacific. Or if it starts at 7, that's 4 p.m. You might not be able to get out of work. Now, the reason I don't 100 percent agree with it is neither of the teams are based in the West coast. None of the teams are based in the West coast for that matter. Exactly. Uh, is it a test? Maybe they pull in. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to say that this is probably going to be on the lower end of the rating scale next week, but it's going to be expected by all parties. Not, it's not going to be a surprise to Fox. It's probably not going to be a surprise to us. Unless again, you get absolutely nobody. Um, but I, you know, Real, I think we divert. Let's talk about our picks real quick last week and then make our picks as we go through this. Because, again, it wasn't – I mean, on both sides of it, it wasn't a very good week for either of us. Now, Zach, you got lucky that I decided to pick against you and won. So you got the lone victory with your Michigan Panthers. But right now, <laughs> it's not looking too good for Refy Boy here. I'm 2-7 and seven on the season. But you know what? Last week's – last week's performance at least brought it made it manageable for me you're five and four so i'm only three off now this is where it gets dangerous though because if we all make the same picks throughout the rest of the season i'm screwed (laughs) (laughs) so i'll start this week i think i know who you're gonna pick but i'm gonna say michigan panthers do pull it out Mm. but who do you who are you thinking here you pull the homer pick well, it's funny. I am going to go to the homer pick, but I have obvious reasons, and it's because you now have a two-headed monster in the backfield with both with both Stevie Scott and Reggie Corbin, as we saw last week. And as I pointed out, the Stars have been god-awful defensively in terms of the run. The Panthers, that's their bread and butter. All you, To me, your game plan as Jeff Fisher is, we're just going to pound them. Right. You know, We're going to do good old-fashioned pound-the-rock football and make them stop us. And if they do... 
well, we better get some bootleg and play action with Shea Patterson getting going and getting either Lenore or Ray Bolden or whoever the hell's out there for the Panthers mm. at the time some sort of action because that's probably what the, what Bart Andrews is thinking is Jesus Reggie Corbin just went off for 133. Stevie Scott's had a hundred has had upwards of close to 100 yard or 100 yard games this year. We need to make sure that that two headed monster doesn't get going early. And we also just went against the Generals, who did that to us in the exact same fashion with Darius Victor, DeAndre Johnson, and of course, and of course Trey Williams on the other side. So you know they're going to come at you with that. I think that the Panthers prevail, though, and they go ahead with it. Um, Case Cookus uh, will get tested, mm-hmm. I think so. The Panthers' defense, you know, as much as they're one and two, legitimately are a pretty damn good unit. Yeah. Um, they have been all over the place. I mean, you know, we had, we had Terry Myrick on the show. Guy has been flying all over like crazy in that linebacking core. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that they don't have many sacks to their name, but their run game, at least in terms of the Panthers, are one of the best in the league at holding down teams for getting easy gaps, easy plays on you through the run game. So Case is probably going to be getting some action with his arm. He's going to be tested downfield a little bit. Um Hey, get that connection with Jordan Sewell again or in company. Bug Howard getting a little bit involved. Mm, Maybe you you have a chance. I think this is going to be a close contest. One of the better ones of the week. Two one and two teams. But I think at least in terms of matchup, you're going to see if the backup QB is ready to sling the rock for a full four quarters and if the Stars can adjust. I think the Panthers pull it out, though, just because their setup, to me, doesn't match up well for the Stars. So I'm going, I'm going Michigan. And I do agree with you. I don't think it's going to be a blowout like last week with the Panthers just running away with it, or at least, you know, shutting them out. Uh, But yeah, I think, I think the Panthers do find a way to edge it out though. Now the next day. So that's the, uh, clearly it's the only game on Friday. It starts at 10 PM Eastern, but we move in. We're getting some Saturday NBC action coming along with our, uh, our next Peacock exclusive. There's only four on the season. Well, this is our second now. So the good news is mm-hmm. you're halfway through after this weekend. One thing I will mention, if you can't watch the game, if you don't have Peacock, make sure you go follow at USFL Newsroom on Twitter. We do live threads, and then we're yep. dropping recaps like minutes usually after the game ends because we're writing them up throughout the game. This one, I mean... I will be watching it. Clearly, I'm watching all of them. But the, right. I mean, this is the last time I can say that this is the time that we need to watch the Maulers to see how things are going to shake out this season. Because if they if they don't get more than, I'll say, 16 points on the boards, there's a problem. Even if it's a win or a loss, there's, there's, there's a problem. And uh, granted, their defense is, is pretty good. The generals, you know, with their running game, it could cause some issues depending on how their defense plays. But I think the magic to their defense is, is those passing plays. So if you got a DeAndre Johnson in there for most of the time for Coach Riley, I I don't know. It, it's it's hard to say. But I think we both agree here that I don't yeah. think this is the Maulers week. I don't think well, it is. I- well, I don't think I think Pittsburgh needs to come out as desperate as they have been. You're 0 and 3. The North is luckily for you the weakest division of the two in the league. So, even if you lost to the Panthers, this would and it and I know it comes against the Generals who are arguably the best one in this division right now. Uh you're going to have to really put together your best game today at least on Saturday uh cuz going 0 and 4 you know, sure, you'll be you'll be one you'll be only two games back. Yes, there's still be six weeks in the season. Fine, you could possibly recover, but honestly, you get you got to find something. You know, I think you got to at least get a win to say that they're still in this playoff hunt realistically at this point, or to show that they're not just gonna keep keeling over right. every week. Because uh, yeah, I, I, it's just as I stated with the week three matchup against the Panthers inconsistency, no flow whatsoever. Go back to what you had in week two, find that magic. If you can, the generals are kind of that are kind of middle of the road defensively. You know, there are places you can at least exploit them. If you want, it's more through the passing attack, which yeah, I know that's Pittsburgh's uh, weakest link right now at this point, but stick with Josh love. Hopefully Bailey Gathers is healthy this week and you can get him back in there, get a rhythm going early. And you have, you know, relatively a two headed monster, at, at least in terms of a committee backfield with Groshek and London, you know, get an even split, find the hot hand like you did 
just get that air attack going a little bit more. That's the thing. And then the Maulers, all I got to say is you better be able to stop the run. Now, you didn't do it last week against the Panthers. So I don't know how much better you're going to have it when you just gave up well over 150 plus yards to the number two rushing offense Mm -hmm. in the league. Now you got the number one rushing offense in the USFL coming at your doorstep and you're going, oh, we got to do this again. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. (laughs) But this is this will be the most desperate you'll see the I think the Maulers so far in the year, uh, if not the most desperate right now, because really they need to establish themselves and get back in this playoff hunt. Mm-hmm. It is becoming close to after this week. It's almost mid season, if not mid season, at this point you can qualify it as. So yeah, you can't be losing too much traction anymore. Yeah, time's running out, but you know what? Saturday two thirty Eastern Peacock. That is when we're gonna find out. So you know, probably not gonna be a lot of viewers there. So if it is a stinker. Not a lot of people are going to see it. Um, now, again, I hope the Maulers do pull it out. Um, but, I, yeah, I just don't see it happening just yet. I thought last week was their best shot, and then we saw how that one played out. Right. But that's the early game. That's the early game. The night game, you're going to be there. This, one's, this one should be good. Again, prime time spot on Fox, 7 p.m. Eastern. Tampa Bay Bandits, Birmingham Stallions. I went on the first two. I gave you the advantage. Come on, break it down for me here. (laughs) Who who are you taking? What are your thoughts on this matchup? Man, bandits and stallions. I know, I know the last week they were gearing up as the battle of the unbeatens in that one or the Mm -hmm. undefeateds as we put it. And, you know, it lived up, it had energy. And now we get to have a second week in a row where, you know, the South is not only, it's the most competitive division in the league, of course, out of the two, but man, we get two back-to-back weeks where it's early playoff implication contests for this division right out of the gate. So the bandits last week looked like going into that game. They might be dead on dead in the water. We're a little discombobulated, come back from behind. They're coming in high on a lot of energy Mm -hmm. coming off that game winning field goal from Tyler Rousa. Jordan Tamu having his best game so far of this young season, 284 sling in the rock. Seemed like he had some sort of chemistry mm-hmm. and found some receivers he can rely on, which seriously, early going for the for the bandits that had been finding who can catch the rock the ball for them. Looks like they found a few people besides Chan O'Greedy that you can have Tom who throw it to. Mm-hmm. And Juwan Washington or BJ Emmons. You know, really Washington shined last week in his in his chances carrying the football. Um, I think for the Stallions, you have once again a very much defensive test for them. Right. As long as the as Todd Haley's crew is firing on all cylinders like they were in the second half or during ma- most chunks of that contest against the Gamblers, uh, you're going to have to get pressure on Ta'amu, which has been possible this year. Um, and you're going to have to bring, I think, just some of the exotic blitzes you did against the Breakers really to throw them off their rhythm and off their game. You know, because mm-hmm. Haley runs an RPOS type of offense, sim- not exactly the same as Fedora, but it still is very similar where it's, you know, quick reads, quick decision making. You know, there's plenty of options you can go to in this scheme. For the Stallions, I can't say it enough. I've said for several quarterbacks in this league, especially Clay- Clayton Thorson, Jamar Smith needs to settle in early and be able to get his mechanics down early as well. Joe Klatt, I mean, Hey, I don't think Joel Klatt wants to do another game where he's critiquing the low elbow. I learned a lot about throwing motion (laughs) from him over this week. I knew some. I learned a lot more from just him talking about Jamar Smith. And I'm hoping to God, and I'll say just his quote, he better have a high elbow, getting that bad boy secure, and throwing it, setting his feet, and delivering to those receivers. Because seriously, I was shocked at how little opportunities Osiris Mitchell had at times. Dude could have had been way more involved. Marlon Williams is a stud when he's given opportunities. And Victor Bolden, most all-purpose yards in the league. I mean, he's going to get his touches. Mm-hmm. So just for Jamar Smith, get settled in, you know, because the Bandits, I'll tell you, we see it the least three, these two, three weeks here. They have a leaky defense. Right. So on. I don't really know what the Bandits are going to be able – it's going to be having to hopefully build upon what you had second half against the Gamblers. Mm-hmm. But for the Stallions, settle in, and you can win this game. That, that's how I see it. And I'm going to go with the home team on this one simply because I don't trust the bandits defensively to hold up against a stallions unit that overall will play all four quarters consistently. 
All right, man, you got to do this to me. So, uh, again, you're not giving me much wiggle room here. I also think the Stallions are going to pull it out. I think that they're they're starting to hit all their gears. If last week was the game that they struggled in, I mean, that's good, right? They struggled, and then they came out on top against another team that was undefeated going into the week. Uh, yeah, Tampa Bay came out strong last week, but look how they did against the Breakers, who the Stallions just beat. They got demolished. Now, not nearly as bad as the Maulers against the Panthers, but they only put up three points that entire game. I'm going to have to go the Stallions here. You're not giving me much wiggle room, but I'm hoping this next game maybe will we'll differ here. Houston Gamblers, New Orleans Breakers, 3 p.m. Eastern, NBC Peacock Joint. I'm just going to break it down for you. I'm going to tell you, uh, you can't break my spirit. This is, you know, I, I made a mistake, but this weekend is truly when the Clayton Thorson Redemption Tour starts. We're going to make it happen. We're going to shock the world. We're going to make the Breakers 2-2, and and we're going to go 2-2 and along with them. I'm ready. I'm excited. I think that the – I think Coach Sumlin has the pieces in place. I think he's definitely had a talking to with his defense. Like I said, hopefully the guys, you take a little bit of my advice. Uh, Northrop, go get some more of those fake cigarettes from the Spencers. Hand them out to the team. Let's get the party started. Smoke them if you got them. You know, not really, but the the fake ones. Right, right. And I think they rebound this week. I think they shock the world and take out the breakers. Now, here's another thing kind of going for them is we don't know the status of of the breakers quarterback, Kyle Sloter. Is he going to be 100%? Is he still have that nagging injury? And I think that makes a big difference, as we saw last week. Sure, he was able to get a couple things going, but it definitely wasn't the slaughter we saw the week prior against the Bandits. Um, I think I think the Gamblers pull it out, and that's really not even just my homer pick. That's truly how I feel. Zach, break it down. You agree? Disagree? You better disagree. Come on now. I I, w- I was I I was on this one e- either way, and I, I I'm not shocked you're going with the homer pick. Um, because I can see how the gamblers can get this win. I, I'm actually, you're saying redemption tour for Thorson. I thought overall, you know, again, I thought there were some things that let him down last week mm-hmm. in terms of penalties, in terms of bad timings, in terms of how drives were going for him second half. Because he had a pretty good game. Oh, yeah. You know, I, he's building week, week on week. He's been getting better. So I think the redemption tour was last week in terms of like showing he's stable at the position. Um, I just don't know if it's going to be that he builds again. Because, look, as much as New Orleans lost to the Stallions last week, they gave Jamar Chase fits in terms of him being uncomfortable in the pocket. Exotic blitzes, great job in the secondary when given. A lot of it was really just bad tackling on a, on a few drives or just penalty penalties at some of these circumstances in that game against the Stallions. Um, or, if we're talking Kyle Slaughter, hold on to that ball, young man. It's like, I mean, hey, this game, that game could have been completely different mm-hmm. if you crossed that goal line without fumbling on a QB sneak. Right. And I do think his health is going to be in question. You're going to be hearing about it. We'll get those reports later in the week as we're going in, or you'll hear about it and we'll add the updates on this as we're doing it. But Slaughter starting, I think, is going to happen. Um, dude's shown he's mentally tough. You know, he was stiff at the end of that contest. That lingering groin injury or groin pop that came Mm. up in week two is there. But I also think that the Birmingham Stallions did a great job making him uncomfortable. And I think the Gamblers can too, but I don't think they'll be able to do it as well. So I'm seeing it's a rebound game for Kyle Sloter. Uh, I think it'll be a shootout, though. Mm -hmm. I think you'll get a part two of what you saw with Gamblers and Bandits week three. Uh, And I think that you'll see the Breakers, though, come out on top. I don't know if you'll see a McGinnis game-winning field goal, though, because uh, right now, if we're talking shakiest of kickers right now, it's amazing that Austin McGinnis has been in that category along with the likes of, say, like a Nick Rose mm-hmm. at this moment. But I think that you're going to see the Breakers, they'll reestablish themselves and get the 3-1. and one. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, if <laughs> hey, if the Gamblers pull out the win, that just keeps showing that the South is the most intriguing of the division. Oh, yeah. There'll be three teams right away at 2-2. Two and two. <laughs> going in right no matter what you'll have two and twos all down the bottom and then the stallions will be sitting at three and one at top if that's the case and you're in your selection right good sir right right i mean this it's going to be a fun weekend any way you look at it hopefully you know take a little bit of nap on friday before the game get some rest because it's going to be a late one it starts at 10 p.m eastern so it's clearly going to probably end 
Saturday. If you're on the East Coast, me, it'll probably end around midnight. But eh, as we mentioned, for the West Coast watchers, sign you up this week. You get yourself kind of a, a normal game, if you will. But those are the picks. You know, I'll be happy if I just get this one win. If I get the rest of them wrong, it doesn't matter because we're even on it. I do want to get them right because my numbers are two and seven. Ugh, well, goodness. yeah, you need to. You at least need to get something reestablished. I'll admit I was disappointed that I finished one and three last week. So I, I mean, I was fine I, with though, it. <laughs> even though I'm above 500, five and four, I'm still like, yeah, it's a little too close for comfort. Man, and like, I started out undefeated week one, <laughs> one and zero because we only picked it, one game. <laughs> as is the gist though with spring football, right. it's so unpredictable. You're right. So. You're right. You know, every, anything's a given. Uh, another week we'll get to evaluate once more is how I look at it. Should be should be a fun time. Uh, the league getting has been trending, in, at least in social circles, yeah. we noticed. And for natural reasons, not like the cigarette yeah. story or pizza or anything. <laughs> There's still the pizza guys that will post on Mauler's tweets and whatever. You know, you, you do you. It's not going away. But, like, it was nice to see the league trending for a good week of football. Like, mm-hmm. people saying, hey – this is good quality stuff. It ain't going, it is, it's, it's something you should tune in and check out. I thought that was pretty nice to see mm-hmm. and keeping that momentum going forward, getting some more positive vibes. The league is promo- I mean, at least in terms of how it's going with the NFL is eight of their officials going to the NFL, baby. Yeah. I mean, Here we go. I, I, we knew that it was a possibility going into the season, but I didn't think we'd be learning about it. Week three, week three, sign them up. Eight guys. So 31 of the 32 officials that they have in the USFL are part of this NFL partnership program, development program. I can't remember the exact name of it, but eight right off the bat. You can't be mad at that. And I mean, this just shows the these leagues aren't just creating opportunities for players and coaches. I mean, it's everything from the broadcast people, the water boy, the officials. All of these guys are looking to take that next step in their career. And the USFL helps them get that extra footage, helps them get that extra visibility. Again, very similar to players and coaches, just something that I don't think a lot of people have ever thought about being a thing or a possibility. Um, But I love to see it happen. And we'll probably see more of this as the season goes through. And I mean, clearly, as we go into more seasons and Mike Pereira kind of touches on that as well, He, he gave a little bit of a statement here. Uh, but right here, I expect that this will be the first of many announcements in the coming years of USFL officials being chosen to work in the NFL. The USFL's close association with the NFL officiating department is not only serving both leagues very well, but is also improving the development and promotion of professional football officiating. So, I mean, there you have it. Now, clearly, we're going to see some players move into the NFL, some move into the practice squads. And maybe move into other leagues as we go throughout the season. But I love seeing it happen. And like I said, I'm very surprised that we're seeing it happen so early in the season. So sign them up. It's been, it's been pretty clean. <coughs> like I, I haven't seen it. There really hasn't been many egregious calls. You know, mm-hmm. Even the only one that can come to mind right away for me was that was just the missed pass interference last week. But again, the next play, you know, they rectified it and scored a TD. So it wasn't like game, the right. game didn't change for you. It could have, but still, you know, that's it. There's been very few that I've been, I haven't really been disappointed. I thought the officials have done a pretty good, have been done a pretty good job. And, you know, we're going to, I'll give a shout out, a shout out here for all the guys that did get their designation to move up to the NFL. So here's the eight listed according to the USFL's press release here. Um, you have two referees, Dwan Height and Alex Moore, two of the umpires, Brandon Cruz and Mike Morton. You have the down. You have a down judge, Robin De Lorenzo. You have a line judge, Mike Cossey. You have a back judge, Tra Boger, and then you have, of course, the final one. The field judge is Low Van Fam. So all four of those, or all eight of those gentlemen, are going to be moving up to the NFL later this fall. Congratulations to all eight of them, and they're going to be still part of the league right now, mm-hmm. getting a little bit more into you know if they have to work out the kinks before they go big time or bigger time. Mm-hmm. This is their chance to do it, but it's nice. They're getting to move up and we'll get another eight probably from the pathway program, you know, for season two going right up in. That's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that they get to work on this. It's NFL rules, which I'm going to stress that the NFL rules have made the game even more professional and higher, higher in terms of how good it looks. Right. I know there's like, for example, people argue 
I prefer one foot Mm -hmm. or people argue they want one foot. I say two feet's better because it makes you look like you're NFL caliber. I agree. And so far we've been seeing good stuff. You should be able to, I mean, who am I to talk? (laughs) I'm just (laughs) an idiot that dresses in a ref shirt. But I mean, at the professional level, you should be expected to have two feet in bounds. And I mean, I'll just say it. And that's one of the great things about what the USFL is doing is they understand they're not the NFL, but they want to create an NFL ass game. Sure. There's some twists on the rules, but they're nothing too egregious. Everything's professional looking. The broadcast is good. So I- I'm with you there. I'm with you there. And I have seen, there's a good fair share of that online. Um, but I, I mean, college doesn't even do one foot anymore. Do they, or they, they, no, still, they still, they still, still do, do one. Oh, okay. Still, do I guess one. I haven't watched yeah. in a while. I thought they changed that a couple of years back. Yeah, so that's still the designation, but I, I'm I'm saying one two feet to me, it's just that's a random thing. But like so far, so good. Um, and it's I mean, I I've been very happy with how the game's been called for the most part. Um, and I think the NFL rule set, at least the base of it in many of the fields, has helped it look that much more impressive for players getting tape or just developing themselves. I mean, here's the thing too. We talk about folks that are moving on. Not all these guys are gonna be able to move on either. You know, some of them won't get offers to the NFL, and that's just me being realistic. I'll mm-hmm. tell you that. Not saying people specifically, but it'll happen. You'll have guys come back to this league. They have that second year contract. They're going to come back and have more chances to not only continue their career, but to build on that tape. And as we've even heard on the United by football, you know, you can look at this opportunity for the league as you can build tape or you can help build a new fo- professional football league. You have right. two options, is how that's given. So, you know, there, either way, not everyone's going to be going, mm-hmm. but it's nice to see that those avenues are there and that that professional setting is helping with that, I think, in more ways than just player development. Exactly right, right. And, I mean, we've seen it all, all over with the USFL. I mean, even the broadcasters, to the broadcasting teams, to a certain extent, not with Joel Klatt or Kurt Menefee, mm-hmm. per se, but, I mean, Jack Collinsworth, uh, Jason Garrett. I mean, these are the... These are the kind of those stepping stones of here. Get a little bit of action here before we move you up into this more visible role. And so, I mean, like I, I've said it time and time again, can't be mad at that. I love opportunities for everybody from from the bottom all the way to the top. And like I said, it's pretty cool to see it happening already. We're not even out of the first season and we're getting good news and again, which is a nice change of pace. Usually, usually there's spring leagues are riddled with bad news week to week and sure the usfl has had their little spats like you mentioned the pizza thing and there's been a couple other things that people have drawn on to but i'd say more or less pretty solid action pretty positive everything's being coming out pretty good everything's coming up millhouse if you will (laughs) it's like one of my favorite favorite jokes from the (laughs) simpsons is that my feet aren't wet Everything's coming up. <laughs> My pants are completely dry. <laughs> before before we go, folks, we got one last bit bit of the, bit of uh, I guess uh, league news, kind of league news. Mm-hmm. It's more just if you for preparing for yourself here. Um, as you know, we're now in kind of the flex schedule drop of the season. Um, we're out of the designated like guaranteed times and network placements. So now every week we're pretty much guarantee we're going to get like the week in advance Mm -hmm. of what we're going to get in terms of scheduling. So we got week five game assignments. So for those that did, that haven't marked these down, here's your chance again to do that. So week five game assignments are are as follows Panthers at the bandits Friday, 8 PM Eastern on USA network for week five. That's may 13th. Then you have the Saturday slate of games, which is only one. I, I overstated that one, but you have the Saturday matchup on Fox 3 PM Eastern time, new Orleans breakers taking on New Jersey generals. That'll be a fun one of two mm-hmm. powerhouses in each one of the divisions. And then Sunday is when we're really going to be gearing up for most of the action. So noon Eastern time stallions taking on the stars. That is then the 15th. And then the final game on the 15th, you have the Maulers taking on the Houston gamblers to end the day's games on Fox on Sunday. So yeah, there, I mean, obviously prioritizing mm-hmm. what they can for best matchups like Saturday, they have the three o'clock um, stallions stars. I mean, Sunday at noon, that's a, a bit of a shakeup going back to more of the middle afternoon, earlier afternoon slate. Again, mm-hmm. it's really a lot of like 
every one of these assignments, like you and I keep seeing, it's experimenting on how the lineup looks like. What are the numbers if we put it here, here, and here? Exactly right. You know? Yeah. Like just throwing stuff at a wall, seeing what gets the best co- outcomes coming back at you now. Well, definitely. I, especially now you're seeing Fox put one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Now, what I will say is I hope there's no superstitious players on the Panthers or Bandits because we got a Friday the 13th game. <laughs> yes. Friday the 13th. So anything that can go wrong could go wrong. Tune in at 8 p.m. on Friday the 13th on USA because it should be a fun one to watch either way. Now, if I'm looking at this schedule here of games that I'm going to be looking forward to, I mean, right off the top, gamblers at Mullers. If we can't pull it out this week, boy, <laughs> we better pull it out that week. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited there. But then I think you you called out, I would say, probably the true game of the week here, the, the Breakers and the Generals. And I think... I mean, depending what happens this week, we might know our answer, but if the generals win going into this week five, I mean, this could be an interesting play because like I said, it only took one or two plays from that week one and the generals would have been in that winning column and be undefeated right now. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's as of right now, that's the one that I think that caught my eye the most, but clearly that. Maulers, gamblers, games got me giddy already. <laughs> and probably for all the wrong reasons, if you're a Maulers fan. <laughs> I mean, I'm just getting used to watching USA Network now, just <laughs> as a Panthers fan, like, ah, back to the Friday grind. We go. Yeah, we go. Get a, but hey, you know, they keep winning. They'll switch it up. That's how this is supposed to work, right? Well, the good Best news matchups. <laughs> the good news is, is you can catch the end of Law and Order right before you go into the game. I mean, that's the best part is the end, you know, I, I mean, I am a sucker for law and order, but I've, I'm, to be honest, I haven't watched it in years. So maybe I'm not, but it well, is. No, well, hey, hey I, I get it though. I, I, I'm also, I'm quite the fan of the original. Yeah. I like hearing the final verdict. I like hearing the swing on how you might think this plays out. And I always like the end quips. They always leave on something for you to take home. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you you can think on it and then go, Oh wait, I got a football game to watch here. <laughs> Well, uh, oh yeah, I'll put that one in the back for later. Yep. <laughs> Save yep, that yep. as an end of night thought. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we have weird dreams, folks. <laughs> <laughs> law, and, law and order coming back to haunt me, <laughs> me for an existential uh, night to end it, going to bed. I don't know. What well, I'm just saying. You know, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I never mentioned the reason why we're recording early. And my wife does watch these podcasts, so she'll murder me if I don't. But it's my wedding, <laughs> my third year wedding, my third year, thir- three year wedding anniversary this week, the day before this podcast drops on Thursday. Cinco de Mayo, baby. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Am I a drunk or a what? I don't know. <laughs> it was either that. I told her because we were originally going to do Star Wars Day, May the 4th. And I, I mean, I like Star Wars and all. But I, ah, I can't be the guy that got married on Star Wars Day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So Cinco de Mayo it was, and I'm looking forward to it. And I'm, I'm, I'm buying her. This is what I'm getting her for a, a anniversary gift. So either she'll learn on this show or we'll have it by then. I'm buying okay. a golf cart, Zach. I'm what? so excited to buy a golf cart. So we live. We have a golf uh, golf course in the community I live in. So okay. over the l- last weekend, w- did I mention the community garage sale? I know I mentioned the uh, Switch Sports, which I no, did beat I have everybody not heard at. This. But we did the community garage sale. I picked up a whole set of clubs over here. Okay. And I turns out they're women's clubs. So now they're my wife. <laughs> No, they're they're wife. my wife's club. So now I got to buy her a golf cart to go along with it. Now, Zach, once you, once you're married, you'll understand the greatest wedding gift is a gift that you also want. <laughs> and I want, I've been wanting a golf cart forever. And she brought it up the other, the other day. And I said, oh, that's it. We're getting a golf cart. And I'm, I'm yeah. excited. I would be posting pictures of it. Now we'll see. My hope is we get it all blacked out. And I'm going to go get one of these gamblers vinyl decals, which. Oh, man. Well, you're, I shouldn't say that. I'm going to the mall and getting one. You don't gonna, sell them yet. you slap a big G on the oh, side of that Oh, thing? hell yeah. I mean. Oh, hell yeah. People around here will love it because in Texas, anything Texas related, they'll, they might not even know the gamblers, but they'll, let, they'll see that sweet Lone Star, the, the silhouette of the greatest state ever created by God donning that beautiful golf cart is probably going to make it go five miles an hour faster. Yep. Just by having that logo on there, but I will take pictures. I will. It might end up being burgundy. I, I, here's the other thing that you don't know. Well, you do know now, Zach, I'm cheap. 
I'm cheap, so I'm <laughs> scouting out the most affordable yet good one because I'm also weird. I don't want a gas one. I want the electric one. Go on. The good term for that is called bang for your buck. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, of, that, that's how you should be calling. I'm looking for my looking for my best value. Yeah. No, and that's exactly right. So that's I'm going to be doing that this weekend as I'm going to tour. There's like three golf cart places. They all close. Here's how you know people are rich when they buy golf carts because I'm not rich. But here's how I know mostly rich people buy golf carts. They close at 5 p.m. every day. Mm. So if you work, okay. <laughs> you're not buying a golf cart. I and mean, that's just the sad truth. Because I, I called the guy, coolest Texan guy ever. He's like, you better be here by 445 because we're not that kind of place. We're out the door once it's 5 o'clock. I said, you guys open on Saturday. Two o'clock, but make it one thirty. Then, <laughs> so, all right, man. So I'll have you in and out five ten minutes. So, sign me up. That's all I need to hear. Fantastic. You're you're gonna be you're gonna be driving that bad boy on the course and hitting the golf ball. That's what I'm gonna call the modern day version of the run and shoot. Exactly right. Well, I mean, we have bars that are. I mean, me. I'm a. I think people have tried figured out. I like to drink, not hard alcohol, but I like a good. Uh, adult water, as I call it, uh, you know, Bud you like Light. A beer. Bud Light, like a you know beer. what I mean? A little water with a with a little uh, bite on it there. But I mean, I live about two blocks, well, maybe about four blocks from the bar. And mm-hmm. I don't like to drive my car all the way there. And sometimes I don't want to walk my drunk person back to the house. Now I have a golf cart where I can leave it. If I get too drunk, just chain it up there. I'm just going to bike lock for it. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I, I'm so excited. It's been years in the making because I don't think I've ever lived anywhere where you could actually drive ride a golf cart. And uh, we're in just such a weird, like middle of nowhere town. I think I told you this, Zach. We have like, I think the last time I looked it up, there's like two thousand people that live in the city I live in. Maybe less, maybe hmm. less. So I mean. That's where I feel safe. Riding bikes and riding golf carts, less than 2,000 people sign me up. Uh, but, Look at you. Or I, you'll see me I, broken up and bruised and scraped up next week because I took a turn too fast. <laughs> we'll find out. I can, I can only dream of having golf cart access in metropolitan Indianapolis. <laughs> it just is not, it's not a thing. Yeah, you wouldn't get very happen, far. You know? my, buddy, nah. my buddy had one when we grew up in, in the Detroit area. And same thing. I always like, why? Right. Like if, I guess if you knew people that lived on the block you live on, right. And then you could just saunter on down on your golf cart. But even then, like, but I'll tell you, this guy pushed it to the limit. He would take it to the Frisbee golf park. That was like four miles away, which one, everybody hated him (laughs) because he's in a a disc golf park with a golf cart. (laughs) <laughs> like, right you know. you know what is supposed to be walking in terms of a sport and then <laughs> of course the police show up because they're like what do you why are you ride, riding a golf cart in a park and of course he's like well it's a golf course he's, they're like <laughs> what they're like disc golf it's a golf course it's a golf, it's a golf cart course and then i think he pointed out he's like i don't see any signs that say i can't have a motorized vehicle and i'm like oh, dude just shut up man let it i mean they're probably laughing on the inside, but somebody called and they're like, we got to see this. What is, why, why would somebody legitimately bring a golf cart to a Frisbee golf course? Like, oh, wow. Cause I mean, it was a nice, decent sized course and all, but it wasn't that big. It wasn't like 18 holes of a true golf course. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not carrying clubs with you. We had a bag of four Frisbees each, maybe. Uh, but those are, those are the, the good old days, but I'm looking forward to it. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to take a bunch of pictures and post it online and hopefully I don't damage it right away because that's something I'm known to do. Be responsible now. Yes, yes, yes. But I'm looking forward. <laughs> I mean, what a fun week for me. I got my anniversary and then Friday roll right into some USFL action. Uh, so that's again, just to wrap it up. That's why we recorded early, but if anything drops between, when we record this and when we go live, we'll squeeze it in. Like I mentioned earlier with the Brian squat, Scott, squat, Scott thing, you know, this point that it'll be there, but we'll let you know if, if we're dropping some major, major news and probably it'll only be one of us. So it'll be pretty easy to tell if it was squeezed in or not. Hey guys, Zach Kyleman here from the USFL podcast, bringing you an addition 
to the show, a little bit of a news update. Remember, we did this show a little earlier this week, so we said there might be stuff like this to add on. I am going to give you a little bit more info and just some discussion on a major news story for the USFL that came out on this Thursday of this week. Uh, so Mick Pereira, head of officiating for the USFL, announced via the league's social media channels that the league is going to be changing their timing rules a little bit moving forward week four and beyond. Hi, this is Mike Pereira, head of USFL officiating. The USFL has been providing unprecedented access and exciting action so fans can enjoy a football experience like never before. We're pleased with the total number of plays being run in our game, but to maximize fan enjoyment, we're also striving to keep the games under three hours. So starting in week four, we're moving to a running clock after an incomplete pass, but only in the first and third quarters. We believe this change will achieve the desired game length while still providing the number of plays you've come to expect in a professional football game. The USFL, staying united by football. So beginning week four, and this is their tweet I'm reading off, quote, in order to maximize fan enjoyment and keep the game under three hours during the first and third quarters of each game, we're moving to a running clock after an incomplete pass. So some people uh, we have noticed have complained about length of game issues. Um, I know that most of them have been three plus hour events, really all of them have. And I can understand why. I mean, these are standard football games. Uh, if you're wondering why the three hour mark is keeps being brought up here, um, it's kind of been like the benchmark has been set by other spring leagues as to try and keep broadcasts within a reasonable time frame. Uh, also, this is more of a speculation zone piece to add on to this. Um, it could be the fact that with Fox being the broadcast partner, you might be having some of their advertisers and other, and maybe their partner NBC worrying about said overrun and time frame issues for games. Another thing you can think about too, this is the first week they're going to be having a 10 PM start time game. Only one of, uh, I believe it was two games this year that are going to be starting at that late time slot. Mainly that that's going to be on FS one this week on Friday. So a few bits going into this new rule change. Uh, it's also going to, like I said, speeds up some some time frames. At least it should help with at least keeping the game moving as well. Uh, the league, for in terms of its quarterbacks, have only averaged about fifty seven percent completion rate for passing, which for spring leagues completely understandable. Um, that's probably going to be hopefully improving as the season goes on. But for the time being, with that along other varying issues slash factors involved. This is to help better keep the game in that three-hour time frame. Also keep in mind, too, viewer retention rates are a are going downward in recent years. This is also where that three-hour mark comes in. It helps to keep a more engaged crowd on these football games. Uh, we'll keep on adding updates to shows as needed. But until then, guys, if this is the only one for this week, thanks for tuning into the USFL podcast and uh, enjoy the rest of week four. Uh, Zach, you looking forward to this weekend? Any fun plans for? Oh yeah, I mean, we have fun plans for yourself. You're going there, to the game, man. so make sure I'm you're following. Down there. Well, make sure you're following Zach over at Zach Kyleman, and uh, I mean, post some of the stuff on the USFL podcast thing too, because. I mean, I'm curious to see what that crowd looks like. Well, I mean, me and my dad are going to be down, are already going to be over there. Like I said, it's a family affair. Um, I'm going to be going over at least for part of, if not the entirety of the Thoroughbreds tailgate group mm -hmm. event, which will be on the north side of Protective Stadium. Uh, that'll be a blast. I've been looking forward to meet him. Now, Trader Ray is, his, is the name that he goes by. Uh, I've been looking forward to talking with him. He organizes it. They have a very dedicated group of fans that come out every week for that um you know i'm i'm excited for that i mean and plus i mean we were we were there week one and you know i know it's crowds have dipped a little mm -hmm. since that week one matchup of course but I, it still has been consistently like they're they're getting in there they're packing in and i want to see how of course protective stadium officials have adjusted because they've made a point they've said hey we we might have underestimated a few things in terms of like workforce and security we've adjusted that fully so this week i'll get to see how they've now kind of retooled that and how maybe it's made hopefully faster to get in, mm -hmm. you know, not a long line all the way back out to uptown. Like we had when we were luckily in the last time we were there. Well, that and the so. beers. Cause I remember on that club side, there was a good, uh, cause we sent uh, Re Royal retros up there. 
And I think he mm-hmm. said it was like a 30, 40 minute wait. And he said, never oh, mind. I said, yeah, yeah no, I yeah. don't need it that bad. I'm good. I'm fine. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're, they're going to be adding some extra staff, at least for those Birmingham games, because you want to keep people happy, keep them coming back to the stadium. Uh, one that was one nice thing, though, I did, it, it, you know, for that, uh, it did seem like some people were coming up for the breakers last week. Uh, so it's, we're seeing some travel. I did see there's a group um, like a group that sits in a particular spot every week for these Birmingham games. They have a Twitter now and they're calling themselves the stable, which I, I, I thought the name oh, was oh. clever. I like it. But we're starting to see not just like the games kind of come together, but the fan interaction piece come together as well like i said any of those quirky little things now i am i'm sad for uh the usfl drone twitter account because we didn't get any of the drone footage last week but hopefully week four is our week maybe there was a reason but i don't know i don't know maybe maybe we won't see it until the playoffs and it was more to test in the beginning of the season just to see how things go save a little bit of money in the middle but bring it back for the playoffs i mean we'll see but let's fingers crossed we want the drones and we're coming up soon, Zach, just in a couple weeks. We're going to be unboxing at least the Panthers jersey and the Gamblers jersey because the Breakers couldn't win last week. You know what, though? Who? You know what? So nice we're doing it twice. Double down on my bet. You know what? Because this time oh, there's man. actual consequences because I'm rooting for the Gamblers this week. So it, it's actually going to hurt me to buy the jersey. If the Breakers beat my gamblers, because it ain't going to happen. See, Zach, this is what you need to do for your team to win. Extra motivation in the ether. I'm picking up a Breakers jersey. But if you don't pull it out this week, I don't know if it's going to happen, guys. But I really want to get it in before the pre-orders are done. So you better get that win in. Otherwise, (laughs) sorry, you're out of luck. So no matter what you you come out on top is what you're trying to say. Well, I'll say this. I do want that. I'll probably buy jerseys for the championship teams or at least who I want to win the championship t- uh, game. But we'll see. I mean, it depends on how the shipping and all that works, but I'd like to have it ahead of time if I can. Uh, but I hope that they'll be selling them at the at the championship game. I think we'll have more merchandise options there. So you heard it, Breakers. Coach Fedora, tip your hat in the breaker style. If you guys can pull it out against arguably the best team in football history, the Houston Gamblers, I'll buy one of your jerseys. But this is the last chance. This is your last chance to get my money. That's it. But in a couple weeks, I'll be unboxing those bad boys on the show. And I don't think I'll have them for the mid-season live stream. But if I do, we will. No, we shouldn't because that's next week. Next yeah, week. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you you won't have them yet. That, those pre-orders will be going into week six. Yep, yep, yep. All mm-hmm. right. Well, we're getting there soon. I'm excited to see them. I'm, I'm curious to see the quality of them. I know they're screen printed. I'm really hoping to see, and I put this out on Twitter. I know I'm just kind of rambling at this point, but I, just a couple points that are coming to me. Put the ref shirts for sale on the USFL shop. Sign me up. I won't be the only one that buys it. Trust me. I know someone out there is going to say, well, that's funny, or that's interesting, or that's cool, and they're going to buy it. Don't make them $100. I don't know what a good regulation ref shirt sells for. 25 to 30, throw it in that range. Let me know when it's there. I'm going to buy it. I'm still hunting down that USFL football. I'm a, I'm a dummy because it was available for pre-order again last week. I said, ah, let me wait. Cause I was going to, I wasn't sure if I was going to buy that breakers Jersey. So I wanted to do it in one order. Nope. Mm-hmm. Sold out again, but the page is back up. I'm assuming we'll get more of those stocks soon. Cause I need one of those. I need one of those here for the studio. Good week, fun week. I think that's it, though, Zach. I think I rambled on about all the goofy <laughs> topics that were left in my brain. You got you got it all out. Yeah, I think the, I'm good now. Got all the bits, got all the bits knocked. <laughs> you, you did, I mean, your head down. The fact that we're talking about golf carts and all sorts of random things is probably a good sign that the show's over. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that's a good way to call it for us. Folks, thanks for tuning in, as always, every week here. Thank thank you for the support, episode 18, and counting for us so far. We cannot thank you enough. As he as the ref has stated, next week, it is going to be a mid-season live stream. We will be propping that up. We'll let you know the time for that. 
but you are going to be tuning in if you want on our YouTube channel. I recommend you subscribe to that right now. Click that subscribe button if you're li- watching the YouTube version. Hit the bell. It builds morale, and it gives you a reminder of when these videos go live and when our live streams are going live, too. Because, mm-hmm. again, that midweek, that mid mid-season one we're doing you're going to want to tune in for that um because we'll be answering a lot more fan questions and a lot more stuff in the now that we like to do with those live streams also follow us on social media for updates on when that live stream or other episodes come out on your favorite platforms including facebook instagram and twitter at at usfl podcast for us again it's at usfl podcast if you're listening to this via audio hit the subscribe button as well and drop a review we would love to hear your feedback there five star reviews are always welcome and others are too because we like to improve the show as best we can for you guys out there tuning in every week and giving us the support that we've been enjoying for, until next time guys for the ref here i am zach kyleman saying so long thank you so much for the support until n- episode 19 our live stream next week enjoy week four enjoy the rest of the games and let's keep building upward momentum with this league things are going in the right direction stay tuned everybody <laughs>